How are we doing, everybody? Doing okay? That's the way. Happy Sunday. It's uh, good to be in church. I've got a few church jokes for us, just as I get set up, just to, you know, put a smile on your dial. Uh, what did God do to cure Moses' headache? He gave him two tablets. These are really bad. What, uh, they're going to get worse. What is a salesman's favorite scripture passage in the Bible? The Great Commission. Of course. What is a missionary's favorite kind of car? A convertible. Please don't defriend me after this. I really like this one. What do they call pastors in Germany? German shepherds. I can say that half my family, uh, you know, has German roots. But um, last one, you've probably heard this one. What is a, a dentist's favorite hymn in worship? Crown him with many crowns. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Oh, I've got one more, actually. I like this one. I like this one. An, an elderly couple was sitting in church. And the wife turned to her husband and said, I've just passed wind silently in my row. What should I do? The husband looks at her and says, you should put some new batteries in your hearing aid. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Pastor Grant appreciated that one. Hey, you know, one of the best uh, stories uh, that I, I can remember of the power of God's agape love that we've been looking at. It uh, happened probably some 15 years ago. And uh, I'll never forget uh, the love that people from this very church, some, some who, are, who are still here today, the love that they uh, showed this particular person. Uh, this person was proud and, and lost. You could, could tell that pretty soon. Uh, quite image obsessed as well. Uh, this guy was an habitual liar, uh, there was a kind of stream of anxiety as a result. He really tried to keep up whatever persona was required of him. And this guy would spend every Thursday and every Saturday in the Valley District, in amongst all the nightclubs, you know, going there week after week with uh, his friends and uh, wasting all the money from his, his part-time job and literally coming home empty week after week. And uh, I remember even one night, for this guy, uh, he had a group of friends and uh, they kind of had his wallet and his mobile phone for whatever reason, not sure how, uh, and they left the nightclubs and they went off to another party over in sort of uh, an apartment in the city and uh, because there was the promise of sort of, you know, girls and cocaine and that sort of a, a party. And so uh, they left this guy stranded in the, in the valley uh, without transport and so he had to walk home uh, at 4 a.m. in the morning in pouring rain. It took about, I think, three and a half hours or so, if I remember. And uh, he was even chased along the way by um, a group of people who I guess were just looking for a fight. Uh, needless to say, this guy was, was lost. This guy was on a, a crooked path. And it was Christians from this church, believe it or not. People, you and me, uh, who reached out. People like Beck Valley, people like Nikki Peck, Daniel East, people that preached and shared about Jesus uh, at high school, you know, even in the face of criticism and laughing and, and other things, there were, were seeds that were being sown as they shared about this Jesus. And then after that, other believers from this community, Chris Ford, Rachel Cole, Dave White, Mel White, Liz White, lots of whites, right? And Micah Manson, they all shared Jesus with this guy multiple times over a 12-month period. And their, their sharing of the love of God, it actually began to cut through. And I saw this, and I'll never forget the change that took place in this guy, like literally overnight, November 2007, and how it changed the course of his life for the next 15 years and will for all eternity. And the reason that I'll never forget that story is because that person is me. That person is me. 
Yeah. Surprise! Ta-da! Nick Riddell, this is your life. Where's Mike Munro? Where are they? They're coming out with, uh, you know, all the video reel. I'm, I really am, though. I'm incredibly grateful to those, those people uh, that here I am today with you. Uh, I was on my way to a Christless eternity, an eternity without hope, a, a highway to hell just without the really cool guitar solo, okay? Um, I was on my way to what the Bible expresses in Revelation 21 is a second death. I'd be shut out from the presence of God in everlasting anguish and despair, but praise be to Jesus. Jesus saves. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus saves, church. And if you're a Christian here today, do you know that this is your testimony, that this is your story, that you and I, we actually share the same story? Uh, don't ever say that you don't have a good enough testimony or a good enough story. You have been saved from second death. You've been saved from an eternity of darkness, of sorrow, of heartache, and of judgment. And that's each and every one of us. So we have a reason to praise and to celebrate and to give thanks. Amen? And I worry sometimes today, I worry, church, that we're becoming more and more politically correct, that even though this is such a central focus and message to the faith that we profess, that even as I talk about it, even as I bring these themes into it within the walls of a church, I, I immediately kind of feel us get uncomfortable, maybe even get a little squirmy in our seats, you know, like, can you say that today, Pastor Nick? Can you, can you focus on that? We don't mention those kinds of things in 2022 anymore, okay? But that end reality, whatever you think it is, metaphorical, However deep you want to go in the description and understanding of that place, whatever that place is and will involve, it was real enough that it moved God to send His one and only Son to save us from it, okay? John 3, 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only, whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, praise God, but rather to save the world through Him. The end point of that love that we've just read was so that people would not perish, was so that people would not die but have eternal life. Every person in this room today and every person we walk by day after day has an eternity that awaits them. And something that separates God's agape love from any other form is that it cares about eternity. It cares about what is eternal. It's based on a bigger picture, a love that is stronger than death. One day, you know, the destination of everyone we know is going to land in one of two places. And I'm not talking about Aldi or Costco as interest rates rise. Amen? Okay. The most loving thing that Beck and Nikki and Mika and others did for me was share unashamedly Jesus Christ's message of salvation. Point me to Jesus. Give me a chance. Just to give me a chance in my brokenness to be saved. And we can't lose sight of that reality, church. We can't lose sight of that message. Our world has such a strong pull on us. It really does. We have to acknowledge that. And it can affect our message and change the narrative that we express. It can make us wash over the greater truth, even without realizing. And so we'll share statements like, man, God just loves everyone. God loves everyone, man. True statement, okay? He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves everyone. No one's going to have an issue with that. Not in 2022. It's an easy sell for us. Because yes, 180%. He loves everyone, man. But it doesn't stop there. There is a so that attached to it. A so that we would believe. A so that we would not perish. That we would not die. That we would be saved through him, amen? That's, that's his unconditional good towards us. That's the power of his agape love towards us. It's set apart. It's a bit different to, okay, I love you. Let that be on the record. Let that be written down. Let that be stated in history. I love you, but now you may perish. 
Bye, Felicia. See you next time. Okay? His unconditional good towards us, his love is shown by giving everybody the chance. He gave everybody the chance through all their mistakes, all their sin, all their pride to be saved, have eternal life, and not experience that second death. And guess what the ultimate good that we could ever will for one another and for others? The ultimate love we could ever do is to share that, to share that, to share the way. We've got to share the way. There is only one way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And agape love is encapsulated in all of that, and we carry that within us right now. May we never, ever lose sight of that church. May we never, ever dilute that down. May we never, ever move on. May the effects of our culture never impact us so much because we're always needing to find something new that we have to find something new about the message that really saves and it lasts and it has an end point and it goes on and on and on. It is the full stop. It is the ultimate. And if we have lost sight, if we've become blinded through this hustle, through this pressure, through society's norms, I get it. I feel it every day. I want to call us back today to who we are to who we really are as Christians, to who we really are as little Christ, to what our message really is and what we live for as a result. We live different. Congratulations, you are different. (laughs) You're unique. I tried all my high school life to be different. Just had to find Jesus. Because the truth is we are actually a people that care about salvation. We are a people that care about other people's salvation. We're the only ones, in fact, who care about it. No one else. The people worshiping across the road, they don't care about it. We care about it. And we're spread throughout this earth. It's our focus, our message. It distinguishes us. Until Jesus returns again, we love people enough to share who he is, to share that he is the door, to share that he's the way in. So I pray, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, oh man, the one who guides us into all truth, as we read your word, as we open this passage today and talk about this thing, would you speak to us? Would you speak to us, Lord? Would you change us as your church, as your people? In Jesus' name, amen. This is the word of God through the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 5 which follows after he boldly is declaring to a church who has gathered the Corinthian church. In the previous chapter, he says, any suffering we might face here on this earth is a light momentary affliction. (laughs) Sounds like a side salad or an entree, doesn't it? Anything you experience here on this earth right now is a light momentary affliction, okay? Preparing him for an eternal glory beyond all comparison. Wow. Take that in. Let that hit you. And so we're told not to look to what is temporary, okay, but what is unseen and everlasting. And so he picks up where he left off in, as we're about to read, and he drives home the why. And as we read these words, guys, I want us to ask ourselves, is this the direction of my faith? Does this resonate with what I believe? Let's be open, yeah? Let's be open. Let's not go into familiarity. I've been to church nine million times. Let's be open. Is this really the direction of my faith? 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 21. Here we go. Verse 1. For we know that if the tent (laughs) that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, We are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. 
Yes, we are a good, good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are known to God is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, praise God, against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be no sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Amen. The truth, the word of God. Take a breath. You did well. You came with me. So good. You know, I've attended three funerals this past month, another one tomorrow, and some of whom were people close to my age. I found myself having these moments with God as I was there. And maybe it's because of just the way that COVID kind of puts the real blinkers, you know, blinkers on us and the heaviness of that. But I was finding it was as if my eyes were being opened again to what this is all about. That, because, you know, funerals, they really put life here in perspective and they put our faith in perspective as well. And I was reminded that the faith that we either do or do not profess and live here it really does come to a head. It it really does come to a head. To say life is short here is an absolute understatement. You know, Google tells me in our nation that one is born every minute and 45 seconds and one dies every three minutes and 12 seconds. You know, Paul obviously had sponsored posts on Google Ads, okay, because those stats affirm What he says at the top there, that life here is really like a pitched tent, which is super scary if you've seen some of the tents that I've pitched. Okay, just saying. But as you watch the three-minute slideshow of someone's life at a funeral, the memories, the brief words that are spoken, you know, those, those few minutes show us that life here really is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone, as as James says in chapter four. Right now, your, your tent might be set up a little better than a Riddell holiday, okay? Praise God. But your permanent, eternal dwelling, everyone say permanent. Permanent. Say eternal. Okay? That's not a house made by three birds renovations. It's not a house made by Hutchinson builders, okay? It's a house made by God. It's a house, a building from God, a place prepared by our Heavenly Father where you and I, we will dwell for all eternity, a.k.a. a long time, long time. Paul wants us to remember that. Remember that as we live in this world. Don't forget it. Because of that truth, as Christians, we live future present. We live for eternity, not for this life. Let me say that again. We live for eternity, not for this life. Man, oh man, I feel the warfare over that statement in this room right now. We live for eternity, not for this life. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. We're looking at our ultimate future destination, and then that impacts 
what we do here and now today. It impacts why you're here in this room. It impacts what you're going to do from this place. The Bible says in verse 7, we walk by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. It's who we are, Christians. You know, we're not yet in that place where we're cheersing with Jesus. What a day that will be. What a day. But Hebrews says, our faith is the assurance, it's a really big word, assurance of things that we hope for and the conviction of things not yet seen. One day we will see them. One day we'll see Jesus face to face. One day we'll be in that reality. But right now we live by faith, being assured that that is what matters, being assured that that is where we're heading, being assured that all our efforts here on the earth are moving in that direction, that it's not a disconnected reality. Sometimes I think we want to disconnect our realities. We want to say like, well, you know, earth is earth and life is life here. And then over here is, is the kingdom and over here is eternity. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have one foot in each camp and I'm all good because, you know, I've got that ticket or I've got that that card that says, I don't, I don't have to worry about a death penalty or anything like that, but we're being encouraged by the Holy Spirit to live in this direction, to live for eternity. Because he openly declares to us that this tent we call life on the earth is second best. And so it beg- begs the question, what are we living for, church? What are you living for? What does your behavior say about what you're really living for as a result of the faith that you profess? It makes a difference. Paul openly declares that life here, as he was saying in there with groans, it's simply second best. Okay? I, I, I was blown away by that reading that. Life here, simply second best. I'm thinking, oh man, you know, Sunshine Beach, Costa Nusa coffee in hand. Okay? Everybody getting along, everybody healthy. Okay, maybe promotion at work. I don't know what that's like. (laughs) Okay, promotion, pay rises, bonuses. Paul says, nah, mate. Sorry, mate. Nah, mate. Second best. Doesn't compare, which is is, is mind-blowing to declare. This is our faith. You have not bought a dodgy product. (laughs) You have not signed up to something that is insignificant. It is far more significant than you would realize. It is huge. So praise God, hey? It gives us a reason to worship, a reason to give thanks. It doesn't compare to eternity, but he expresses that. Even though that might be the case, he says, don't wait around for the bus. He says, while we are here, we make it our aim to please God. Hebrews 11, 6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so we please Him by living heaven motivated, eternally motivated. Our our faith focuses our energy in that direction. And guess what heaven's motivation is? That none would perish. It's not that we would have a good reputation. It's not that we would preserve our image. It's that none would perish. How do people not perish? They hear about Jesus and they get a chance to respond. How they respond is up to them. But sharing Jesus is the most loving thing we could do. Does that factor in your outlook calendar? Does that factor in your five-year goal? Does that factor in what you feel your, your, your life with. We're being challenged here by the Holy Spirit that it's got, to make, it's got to have space. It's got to be in there. It's got to come in. This is who we are. This is who we are, church. You know, my, my shwigamuta, okay? My shwigi, a.k.a. my mother-in-law, Maria. Okay, she's German. She used to always say to me, you know, in a way cooler voice that kind of sounds like a David Attenborough moment, Okay? She'd say to me, Nick, we are spiritual beings living in an earth suit. We're living in an earth suit. And what we do in that earth suit matters. We, we, we make it our aim, verse 9, to please God. We make it our aim to work with and for Him while it is still day because guess what? There is no night shift in eternity. 
There is no night shift. There is no second chance beyond that. People do not get that second chance later. We can't make up for lost hours. We can't cash in on overtime. Life is short. Instagrammers, influencers, life is short. Afterpayers, life is short. Sunday brunches, life is short. River Life Church, life is short. Life is short. What needs to change about what we currently think matters? You know, New York Times best-selling author Daniel Pink conducted the largest study on human regret this year. He found in the data that he, he gathered that people's regret at the end of life came under four main categories. They're up on the screen. I found this so fascinating. Number one, regretting not caring about the future. Number two, regretting lost opportunities not taken out of fear. Number three, regretting compromising on core convictions. And number four, regretting not tending to vital relationships. That at the end of the day, we as the human race, okay, large data gathered here, that these things were what mattered most across our world. You think of your life now and think of your faith, even though we might be sitting in this room, this can be our story too. This can be your story, getting to the end, having not cared about eternity, having not cared about what will matter, holding back out of fear, fear of the world, fear of others, compromising on your conviction, compromising on the message that you've given your whole life to, not loving people enough to share the, the hope that we have. You know, Pink, who also was Al Gore's speechwriter, he said his hope is that our awareness of these regrets would enable us now to change what we focus on. You know, does all our energy, all our focus, does it go into our own little tent? What's our focus? You know, my, my two-year-old son, Oscar, at the moment, he currently has one sole focus, and that's watching terrible videos on YouTube of people pushing lawnmowers. Okay, I'm not sure who got him into that. It must have been his mum, uh, you know. <laughs> All right, I'm talking it's 5.30 a.m. in the morning in winter, and I come into the room. He's been sort of yelling out, and I say, good morning, Oscar. And he goes, daddy, watching mowers? <laughs> watching mowers? And I go, no, buddy. And he waits, and he looks back up at me with his intent in his eyes, and he says, soon, daddy, soon. Soon, watching mowers soon. <laughs> Oscar's convinced. He gets up out of his bed, full with that conviction. If he's fortunate enough, later that day at 5 p.m. in the evening, okay, 5.30 in the morning, 5 p.m. in the evening, if Paula is like stretched and is trying to make dinner, okay, then Oscar gets to watch some horrible dodgy videos where people are pushing lawnmowers over water balloons and there's some kid backing track to it and he thinks it's amazing, all right? He's convinced, soon, daddy, soon. And do you know soon, daddy, soon? We'll be in that great cloud of witnesses. Soon we'll be before our Father in heaven in the place that he prepared for us. And so with that being true, again, what do we care about now? What do we really care about now? What do we risk for? Is it connected to the life after this life, which our whole Christian hope is built upon? Is it treasure attached to heaven? Is it souls, lives, generations to come, salvation of the Lord? You know, I sometimes worry that the, the Christian culture that we're a part of is Instead, more focused on, on living for today and asking God to just bless it. That, that, that's our message. Just bless today, God. Bless today. If we're more focused on storing up treasure on the earth and asking Him to, to multiply. We, we leave the eternal matters. We leave them. We disconnect from them. And this is what our world tells us to do with the other 166 hours after you leave church and head on out, it's telling you, hey, man, cram it all in. 
Go for it. Don't miss out. You do not want to miss out. You do not want to miss out. You do not want to miss out. It is all about life here. It is all about more. It is all about look at what others around you have and be consumed by it. Just scroll again. Just swipe again. Just take that in. Look at everybody else's life. Look at it. Look at it. Let it feed you. It'll feel good. It'll feel great. It'll feel great. Live for that. Live for that. Live for that. Live for that. You know, like seriously, sometimes I, I think we worry about being brainwashed by a church. I'm like, hello. Hello. Hello, what is happening to us? What has is, what is changed? Somebody comes up with an idea, they release it into the world, and we eat it up. And we eat it up, and it actually changes us, okay? Don't, don't ignore the fact that it's changing and shaping you, okay? There is a reason why Simon Sinek says in bookstores there is a whole section called self-help, and there is not a section called help others. Okay, self, self, self. Uh, th this week I was sitting at a cafe. I was going through my photos, okay? Again, this is sincere, good, all right? I I'm looking at photos of my family. I'm scrolling through it as I'm sitting there having a, having a coffee. This is great. And I felt like the Lord just speaking to me and just go self-obsessed. Like self-obsessed, like self, my life, my life, my life. Look at my photos. Can I show you my photos? Can I show you my photos? And here I am, Jesus has saved me from an eternal life, and it just doesn't get into my head very often, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't come in. It's not circulating around. When we live for God and we live for eternity, then, then love and unconditional good becomes this, this greater priority, okay? Verse 11 of our passage said, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing the fear of the Lord, not the fear of the world, not the fear of missing out, knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing He is Lord God, we persuade others. We want to persuade others. We persuade them of what we're living for, of our message. We love them that much. If we are assured that our faith really means what it means and it really matters, then we don't spectate the path of those that we know aren't saved. We don't spectate it. We don't Bye-bye, bye-bye, you know? That, that's not who we are. It's not who we are. His love in us cares about that. His love, it hits us in the feels. It moves us. And the outworking of that is that we persuade others. Everyone say persuade. Okay, we share about Jesus just like amazing people from this church did 15 years ago. I'm so, so grateful. Persuade means to seek to cause someone to believe especially after a sustained effort. Okay, it's like Oscar with his watching mowers. Soon, soon. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. Oscar will share it with you. If you walk into our house, he will grab your hand and walk you onto the couch and be like, you want to watch some mowers? You know? He loves it. I don't know why, but he loves it, all right? Our world says to us, don't persuade. And it says it, don't proselytize. Anyone heard that word before? Don't proselytize. Sounds kind of ugly to say, like, ugh, what are we doing? Heck, I don't want to do that. That sounds bad. Sounds like a bad image. And we need to be honest with how much that has influenced and how much that has quenched the agape love of Christ that we have for people. It's been given to you. When you were born again, when you said yes to Jesus, he came in. He came in. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. He doesn't come in and go, mediocre love. He doesn't come in and say, oh, you're only going to get 5% of me because of your Enneagram, okay? Your Myers-Briggs says otherwise, so you'd leave all that out of the Bible. He comes into all of us, ordinary people, and he says, in your weakness, I'm going to be so strong. I'm going to grow in you. I'm going to make you something that you're not. You know, I, I was... <laughs> kind of laughing, but it also hit me. We as a staff, we went to a retreat, and when we were at that retreat, kind of the message was, well, you can be here, but you're not allowed to proselytize. <laughs> and, and I was just like, okay, so here's a staff full of leaders of, of full-time vocational ministry, pastors, but make sure while you guys are here, you don't try and share with people the very thing that you've hinged your entire eternity on. Make sure, okay? Keep it to yourself is the message that we believe is coming from the world. And I know for me, speaking from experience, I'm preaching to myself here, we eat it up. We eat it up. 
I found myself already conditioned like a puppy dog, okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yep, yep, okay, yep, no, we'll be good, we'll be good, we'll be on our best behavior, we'll be good. Ah. We're often conditioned before we even walk into a room, before we walk into a public space. You know, the, the enemy has us believing it would be so wrong, it would be so wrong for us to do such a thing, it would be so wrong for us to, to share. And that's a little bit messed up, church. That's a little bit messed up. I hope that there's a little bit of anger arising in you, a little bit of like, oh, no, like that doesn't sit right with me. I don't want that anymore. No, thank you. Because we believe that this truth is the pearl of great price. We believe that this treasure is worth going and, you know, digging up the whole field. Okay, as it says in Matthew 13, but the world says, don't proselytize anymore, which means don't try and persuade anyone. You know, don't fear the Lord, fear man, fear the world, fear this temporary life. Fear your tent, your tent may rip. <laughs> and I know it's tricky for us. I know it is tricky. I know it is complex. So are many things. So are many things. I believe if we are really convinced of something, we will have a crack. We'll have a crack. We'll have a crack. We'll have a go. I'll have a crack at Wordle. <laughs> Sometimes seven times. I'll have a crack. I'll have a go. I think that the agape love looks for a way. It looks for a way because it cares. It just cares that much, okay? It doesn't not care. It's not okay with people every three minutes, boom, another one. It's not okay with the suicides we're seeing so regularly. It's not okay, agape love doesn't spectate, agape love doesn't sit there and go, that doesn't matter. How can I share? There's so much value in this message that I'm holding, that I, I'm, I've got, and I'll risk my temporary image if it means you might receive eternal life. I'll risk polite by the world's standards in order that something permanent could play out by God's standards. And this is where the change needs to take place in us. Paul shares the key. Verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. Controls us, okay? Because we have concluded this, one has died for all. The love of Christ controls us because we have concluded that Jesus is really the savior of the world. He's our savior. The Passion Translation says, Christ's love fuels our passion because we are convinced, like Oscar, <laughs> one has died for all. The Message Version says, Christ's love has moved me to such extremes because his love has the first and last word. Whoa. And so we care and we share. It's, it's who we are because we've come to the conclusion that that, that is it. That is it. That's not an add-on. We don't give our life away for an add-on. We give our life away to something that frames our entire existence, everything we do. And we've concluded who Jesus is for us, and as a result, we know what it means for our neighbor. We know what it means in our workplace. Is this the same gospel you've received? Have you concluded what Jesus has saved you from? Jesus said, we who have been forgiven little, love little, but we who have been forgiven much, love much. Luke 7. Here's the truth. As I shared earlier, we've all been forgiven the same. We've all been forgiven the same. There's not drug story, wow, power of God's love versus person who's grown up in the church, served in kids' church their whole life. We actually have the same testimony. Our story is the same. We've been forgiven the same amount. We were all on our way to a place of torment and anguish where God would not be because we were born into a sinful world. It's all in us, and that's what he saved us from. Yes, there are benefits. Yes, there are blessings how he redeems our life, but our testimony is the same. Our message is the, is the same. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life now and forever, always. There's no other way, there's no other door. He's it, he's it, he's it, he's it. Same message, same message. 
If that's not happening for us at the moment, if that's not something that is in the forefront of our mind, if we're not caring enough to act, if we're not moved, then we're believing a lie. As simple as that. You're not a bad person. Let me tell you, let me tell you again, you are not a bad person. You should not feel shame. You should not feel guilt. You are not a bad person. But would you humble yourself enough to say, I've been believing a lie. I've been believing a lie about the value of that, and I've been believing a lie about what I should live for here. And it's trumped over eternity. And maybe, just maybe, it's the same lie that caused Eve to eat from that apple. Maybe, just maybe, it's sowing a seed of fear in you that maybe God's whole story, God's whole way, is, is, is not really good enough. Maybe it's second best. Maybe it's weird. Maybe it's so far off that we're like, nah, I'm not even connected. He's the prince of lies. He's in the airwaves of our world. This world is not under submission to Christ Jesus and his kingdom. So maybe, just maybe this morning, you're believing a lie. If we're not sharing Jesus, we're being deceived. We're being blinded. And rather than get angry at yourself, as I said, let's get angry at the devil. Let's get angry at the devil. We get angry at our kids. We get angry at our workplace. We get angry when a Tesla cuts us off in traffic, right? We lose our plot. Have you ever lost your plot at the devil, your enemy? Let's get angry at him. He's the one tricking you. You're not an idiot. You're not a bad person. Him, he is so conniving. He's set up against God. Yes, he's a wounded dragon, I guess. He's defeated in the end. Okay, but he's still lying to you and he gets a lot of pleasure out of doing it. So the biggest thing that can hold you back as a Christian who has had Christ come into you is what you believe about it, how you see it, what you receive. We walk by faith. How does faith happen? In our hearts and in our minds, what we connect to, what we attach to. If he can come in and get in the way of that, he can disempower us and cause us to live our whole lives. Maybe we're saved in here, but we're not living for eternity. We're not living this life he set out for us. And so would you get angry at him for stealing that from you? Get angry at him for stealing your neighbors, for stealing away, for taking who you are, for robbing you of what actually will ultimately fulfill you while you're here on the earth. Dead set, sharing the truth that we have and loving people this way is the most fulfilling thing we could do. The Son of God, Jesus himself said, it is my food to do the will of him who sent me. Okay, John 4. Some, some translations say it's my meat. Arr, <laughs> sustenance. Yum, yum. Protein. Get it in. Okay, you know, the first mission that I ever did straight after I was, I was converted, it was like right off the back of it, was Gold Coast Schoolies Week, and Mick and Manson, my leader, took me into these high-rise buildings, and we're going in, and we're loving on people, and you're stepping over the condoms and stepping over the bongs on the floor, and you're kind of hiding it from the person in your team that, you know, might have culture shock and all this stuff, and these rowdy guys, like, on night one, and by night four of us going in and loving them, and they're like, why are you guys here? What's this all about? What's your message? And our message is that Jesus loves you. He died for you. He made a way for you in eternity. And seeing these guys throw all that away, put it all in the bin, Go to Gateway Baptist Church the week after and get baptized. Hallelujah. You know, there is nothing that satisfies. I was all in. <laughs> I was scared when I gave my life. I was like, oh, Jesus, I was crying. I was like, this is a big thing to say no to the world, to say yes to you, to give you everything. But when you go the week later and you do that and you see that on live, you're like, I'm in. I'm throwing everything out. I am all in for this. I want people to experience that. There is no greater thing that I can say that Jesus Christ used me, just like he used those people, to share the gospel, to share the good news with people, and as a result, they are not going to perish. They're going to have eternal life. I think that our Christianity, we struggle so much through it because we never do the very thing that actually sustains us. 
that actually feeds us, that actually fulfills us. We get so scared of it. We're being so lied to that it's going to be so horrible that we never ever step in. And so we live in Christianity and it's hard going and it's like the world just wins another round, another round. They win another round. When you look someone in the eye and you share, Jesus loves you, Jesus died for you. You see that. It changes you. It's the most loving thing we can do, but it's also the most satisfying thing. So don't let the enemy rob you of your Uber Eats order. Right? The food you love. Don't let him rob you of that. And the Apostle Paul finishes by declaring to us who we are. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a? He is a? New creation. So there was an old you, and there's now a new you. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. We are new creations in Christ. Hallelujah. We are not the old you. You didn't add Jesus, but stay the old you. You didn't come to a church, but stay the old you. His spirit is in you. And some of us maybe have received that truth many, 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 many years ago. Maybe it's on your journal. Maybe it's a bumper sticker. You know, the enemy can cause you to forget. He can deceive you. It's his job. It's what he does. It's his only weapon. It's the only way he gets authority is by deceiving you. And in order for truth to be true of you, it has to be stewarded by you. So some of us this morning, we've got to steward that again like we're stewarding it for the first time. Like we're being called back to first love. Like we're being called back to being a baby again. Soft skin. Eyes opened. Wow, this is what I believe. Wow, this is who I am. This is what he's given me. This is Jesus. Jesus Christ, he's not mucking around. You're a new creation. You are a walking earth suit full of the agape love of Jesus Christ. And that's amazing. You're amazing. Thank you. (laughs) It's a blessing to know you. It's a blessing to do community with you, knowing that that's who you are and that's what you carry. And because of that, you love people. You love people. Do you know that? Can I say that to you and look you in the eyes as I can't do it with so many? <laughs> you love people. You really, really love people. You really, 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 really love people. You care. You care. It's who you are. You don't live for the grind of this world. Say no to the enemy. You don't live for the grind of this world. You will be joining that list of regrets at the end of your life. Life is short. The tent is tearing. Yes, God. Just come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Speak. Reveal. Let it sit. Come on, these lies, these weeds, Lord, put your hand in. Put your hand into our hearts, the hearts of those you love today, the hearts of who you are for. Put your hand in and rip them. Rip those weeds. Rip those weeds. And since your love got a hold of me, since your love got a hold of me, I'm a new creation. I'm forever changed Since your love got a hold of me Since your love got a hold of me I'm a new creation And I'm forever changed Since your love got a hold of me Since your love got a hold of me I'm a new creation I'm forever changed 
It's who we are, church. It's not Nick Riddell. It's you. It's you. It's, it's us. We have a love in us. It's been given to us by the Lord, and we are a new creation. We care about salvation. We care about eternity. We live for it. It's who we are. And so would you stand with me if you're able? I'm believing that where we've been blinded, today, boom, our eyes are going to be opened. I'm believing God does that. He's going to open your eyes. If you're humble, if you're open, no matter how familiar, no matter if you're feeling jazzed or feeling down, if in faith, genuinely, sincerely, you're hungry to be who you were created to be, to live from that place, to love well, to care. I'm believing that there's going to be a shift in our church. I'm believing and declaring there's going to be a shift in our church. It is not going to be hard to love people. I just break that lie in Jesus' name. That lie is so strong. I feel it pushing back as I'm saying this. I feel it. I feel it. I just say, get off in Jesus' name, that lie. Lie of Satan. If you want to press back against it as well, just tell those lies in your mind. Tell those things that come into your heart. Just say, no, I say no to that. I say no to that. Christ in me is greater, the hope of glory. I'm believing that some people uh, will even take a step. In this day, there'll be a grace to take a step to share the agape love with someone. I believe that. I believe that's going to come upon some people and you're going to eat that food and be satisfied, be satisfied. But I want us to read out this declaration if we can get it up on the screen. Okay, we're going to read this together. This is who we are. I'll give you a moment just to give it a quick scroll, <laughs> quick uni read, and then we're going to say it together in faith. And I'm believing it's going to be a shift because this is the only thing stopping us that we continue to allow the enemy to lie to us and get away with it. When this is who we are, this is what we've been given. Okay, so we're going to say it together. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. I declare that I am a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. I live for God and heaven is my home. Therefore, I love people. I care about their eternity. I break the lie that I can't love. I break the lie that I can't share Jesus with the world. I declare the love of God in me is greater. I am anointed and this is who I am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on.